Thank you, Danny. So before I get into this talk, I want to give a brief content warning. This talk will contain descriptions of domestic abuse and descriptions of surveillance within domestic abuse. If either of those things are going to be triggering or uncomfortable to you, please feel free to step out. Now, as I'm sure you are all very much aware after the session, intimate partner violence is a widespread phenomenon affecting one in three women worldwide. And as I know you have heard, of those women, 63% experience tech abuse, where technology is used to facilitate their abuse. Now, I volunteer, along with Sophie, with a group known as the Madison Tech Clinic. We work with advocacy groups local to Madison, Wisconsin, to assist survivors with their tech security. And as a part of this volunteer work, many of our sur uh, the survivors that we worked with expressed concerns that their partners were using covert devices to spy on them, conducting intimate partner surveillance. And this is not something that is just local to Madison, Wisconsin. News articles have shown that there are reported cases of abusers using these covert devices to spy on their partners all across the country. This is a widespread phenomenon, and we decided we had to do something about it. We asked the following questions. What devices are available for abusers to purchase? How do they work? Are they effective at enabling IPS? And if there are effective covert devices available to abusers, are there useful detection tools available for survivors to protect themselves? Before I get into the meat of the presentation, though, I want to clarify what I'm referring to when I say covert device. This is something that records sensitive information, like a camera, a microphone, or a GPS tracker, that is either small enough to be hidden, about four centimeters to a side, or disguised as an everyday object, so if a survivor were to see it in their home, they wouldn't immediately know they're being spied upon. Things that are not covert devices are IoT devices, like Sophie covered, CCTV cameras, stand microphones that are too large to be hidden, and advanced spyware technology that requires technological expertise to be used. We are focusing on devices that are intended to be used by the everyday person. To answer our questions about covert devices, we engage in a large-scale measurement study. We started by performing an online crawl of five retailers, Amazon, Walmart, eBay, Best Buy, and Home Depot, gathering 6,403 listings. Now, many of these listings were not for covert devices. Many of them were for things like books or t-shirts, so we then had to classify these listings. We used two techniques, a heuristic classification system and a log regression classifier to get down to just the listings that are covert devices that could be potentially used in IPS. This was 2,248 listings. We then took a representative sample of these listings to conduct a manual qualitative analysis. The listings in, our, in these 2,248 were not evenly distributed among the five retailers that we crawled, and so our sample of 168 products was designed to reflect this uh, disparity in the distribution. During our manual analysis, we tried to understand what technology is used in these devices, what do they record, how do they communicate, whether there is evidence that these devices have been used for IPS, so on and so forth. After that, we took a sample of 11 of these spy devices, these covert devices, that represented the available information collected and the available communication technologies. We then tested those in our lab to determine whether they would be easy to use for an abuser and whether they could effectively enable IPS. So our first question was, are covert devices available? And the answer is yes. All five of the retailers we crawled sell devices that could be used by an abuser to enable IPS. And of the 168 that we manually analyzed, 50% were less than $20. And at this point, I want to stress, our crawl did not use any special techniques. We used the standard search APIs of all of these retailers using simple queries that any abuser could come up with. As such, any abuser with an internet connection could find and purchase all of the devices that we found in our study. We had to ask then, are these devices, are the sellers of these devices aware that they can be used for IPS? As you may well know, Amazon, Walmart, and eBay allow third parties to sell products through their websites. And what we found is that on each of these websites, there were a small number of devices that are explicitly advertised for IPS. 
either in the title of the product and its text description or in the images associated with the device. And notably, neither Amazon, eBay, nor Walmart forbid this behavior. They do not mention anywhere about promoting abuse or promoting surveillance of others. And while there were many devices that did not mention IPS in the actual product descriptions, there were many reviews that described these products' use for IPS, usually in glowing terms. So it is clear that the individuals selling these devices are aware that they can be used for IPS, and they either condone this practice or they don't care. Now, regarding the types of devices that are available, we found that there was a roughly even split between devices that record somebody's location, record video, or record audio. More interesting is the distribution of what communication technologies we found. A little over a third of the devices we analyzed use purely local storage, SD cards that have to record the information and then be retrieved by the user. That means that these devices are not useful if the survivor and their abuser have separated, but if the abuser and the survivor still live together, these could be used to facilitate IPS. Most of the location trackers we saw use 4G LTE to report location from anywhere in the world, and most, many of the cameras we saw use Wi-Fi to stream and send recordings to a cloud that can then be viewed by their user. We note that 3% of the devices that we examined use Bluetooth, but this 3% includes things like Apple AirTags that have much anecdotal evidence stating that they are being used for IPS. So we stress that this chart is not showing the percentage of devices actually being used, simply the percentage of devices that we observed in our crawls. Now, I previously mentioned that we purchased a sample of these devices and tested them in our lab to determine if they are effective, and the answer is they are. They were easy to set up and use, and they were effective at recording information. Video recordings and audio recordings were clear, and GPS was often accurate to within a block. So, we know that there are covert devices. They're available to abusers, they're cheap, and they're effective at what they claim to do. But are useful detection tools available for survivors who want to protect themselves? To answer that, we want to set out three criteria for what makes a detection tool successful. First is identification. Can this tool determine whether there is a device in your house, in your room? This is similar to the magic wand that Sophie is saying. A binary, yes, no, there is a device, there is not a device. Once a device is identified, can the detector localize it? Can it lead the survivor to where the device is? These are designed to be hidden or disguised, so this is very critical if you want to actually remove the thing. And finally, there's usability. Many survivors of IPS are not technological experts. So any detection tool that we recommend has to be able to be used by somebody with little technical skills. Now, to find out what detectors are available for purchase uh, physically, we performed a very similar crawl to that of the covert devices of the same retailers. And we found that it, the space of available detectors was very homogenous. Almost all of them claim to use either an RF detector, a magnetometer, or an infrared lens detector. As such, we purchased one physical device detector to test in our lab. We also found that many apps on smartphone app stores claim to detect arbitrary covert devices. They claim to use, again, infrared lens detectors or your phone's magnetometer as an RF detector. As such, we downloaded a sample of 11 apps, both on iPhone and Android, that represented the available claim detection technologies and the available claimed detection types. Do they detect just cameras? Do they detect arbitrary bugs? So on and so forth. So, are these commercially available detectors work? No, they don't work. They don't work at all. Our experimental setup placed a covert device in a fixed location, and we placed each of our detections tools at fixed points around that covert device at differing distances. And after analyzing the data that we recorded, we found that absolutely none of them could detect our covert devices. I'm not going to go into details about these graphs. There's more details in the paper. But suffice it to say, there was little to no correlation between distance from the device and what the detector was reading. In some cases, they're simply technologically incapable of detecting covert devices. 
I said in the last slide that these apps claim to use a magnetometer as an RF detector. I don't know if you know this, that isn't possible, magnetometers can't do that. In other cases, like the hardware RF, the hardware uh, device detector, it is doing what it's technologically claiming. The RF detector is detecting RF, but it is so sensitive to the precise position in the room that it is completely useless as a device detector. So these aren't useful, but there's more than just commercial detectors. There are also academic systems, systems like Snoop Dogg and Lumos that attempt to both detect and localize Wi-Fi devices. Snoop Dogg focuses on Wi-Fi enabled cameras, while Lumos focuses on all Wi-Fi enabled sensing devices. We reached out to the authors of these papers and received prototypes for testing in our lab. And while both of these papers have very good science behind them, we unfortunately believe that they are inappropriate for an IPS survivor to use in their current state. Snoop Dogg was very difficult to use, requiring tuning that necessitates uh, technical knowledge about how Snoop Dogg works. And Lumos, we were unfortunately unable to replicate in our lab. We believe it requires more research work to bring it to a suitable state for wide consumption. So good science, but not at this moment appropriate for an IPS setting. So what do we need to do? We need techniques that are usable and effective, that can detect diverse devices. These are things that are designed with survivors in mind, ideally with survivors in the design process. And they need to detect things more than just Wi-Fi. I said that there's 4G devices, Bluetooth devices, and local storage devices, and they all need to be detected. We also need policies that prohibit the sale of devices that advertise for IPS. This is unconscionable, uh, promoting and advertising for IPS, and it should not be allowed on these online retailers. Finally, we need guidelines for developers to design devices that resist IPS use. Many of the devices we found were not advertising for IPS, but they still had reviews that claimed that people could use them for IPS. People who are designing devices to record information should keep in mind that this use case is possible unless they actively work to prevent it. Thank you.